Hello everyone, Matt Dixon here with Purple Patch Fitness and I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about Ironman Santa Rosa coming up in, uh, in not too far away. So hopefully we can give you some good advice to navigate through the weekend itself and give you some inside knowledge. We're obviously based in San Francisco just down the road and uh, so we've spent a lot of time on this course and uh, so hopefully over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to give you some insight into how to think about the swim, the bike, the run, and some overall general tips, which I'm going to start with. And then we'll go into some questions from you guys, the audience, so that we can hopefully give you some customized. I will try and keep it brief. I've got my trusty notes here so that it keeps me on track because I'm a talker. I can uh, certainly talk too much. So this is the first real running of Ironman Santa Rosa earlier in the year. They had Santa Rosa 70.3. And it's taken the place of the historic Vineman. Vineman 70.3 and Vineman, a wonderful race. And so one of the things you're guaranteed with this race is very, very good production. It has a wonderful crew of uh, race directors and, uh, and has a, a wonderful organization. And by all intent and purposes, while it's somewhat sad to see the, the end of Vineman, the end of Vineman 70.3 as well, at the same time, I think that there's a real step up here. There's a step up in the swim course from the old river where you used to be able to essentially stand up when you got tired uh, to the bike course where it maintains the features of the wonderful scenery with the wine country that you go through as well as a run course now that in the heat of the day that's going to come across with with what is a northern california july event you're going to ultimately have a run course where you get to have a little bit of shade and a little bit of variance on the course at the same time so I think overall, it's a great step up. Let's start with some general tips to start because I think it's very important. This is a race that is gonna end in Santa Rosa. And Santa Rosa, while it's not a huge town, it's a pretty big town. And it does have a two transition race. And that's really important, not just on the race day with your family and friends and some of the logistical questions, but I think it actually has some real influence on how you plan your weekend and the days leading up to the race. You have the swim start at Lake Sonoma. You're gonna come out and then you're gonna do a point to point bike where you'll finish the bike ride in downtown Santa Rosa. And then of course the run is an out and back three loops where you're gonna finish with a wonderful setting for a race finish. It's gonna become one of the iconic settings for a race finish right in the square of Santa Rosa, which is super. But the first tip I'd give you guys is it's probably worth taking advantage the day before the race for the racking, utilizing the concierge service by um, Tri-Bike tri Transport. Um, I don't have any affiliation with Tri-Bike Transport at all. Uh, I don't have any sponsorship agreement or anything like that. But I do know that earlier in the year, having your bike been able to take it across to transition with the fact that it's Santa Rosa and there's some pretty good traffic with the wine country being around there, many people in May spent a couple of hours driving to the first transition, racking their bike, having to come back out, and the day before the race, spending two hours in the car is not optimal. So uh, just an insider tip, I would, I would say, hey, spend the 40 bucks or whatever it is, alleviate the pressure, and in the morning go up there if you wanna go and look at the swim course and navigate. The other thing on race morning, it's got plenty of light in the morning, you're gonna be able to see the layout of the swim course, the layout of transition, you're gonna be forced to get up there very early before the swim. So you're gonna have plenty of time to get yourself acquainted with the scene up there. So I think that that's a really important component. Generally on the weekend as well, you do realize that if you are staying in Santa Rosa, you're gonna head up to the race start. It's a good 30 or 40 minutes away. So even on race morning, you wanna plan ahead, you wanna think through your logistics, which is very important. Let's talk about weather as well. It's Northern California and it has, does have influence, slightly less influence than maybe the, re, the May edition of the Vineman 70.3, but you can still expect there's a good chance it's gonna be very foggy in the morning. And that means low temperatures. So you can expect in Fahrenheit temperatures, high 40s, low 50s. And by the time that you're on the second half of the bike ride and the sun has probably burst out of the fog, uh, and out onto the run, you can expect some very high temperatures, depending on the day, 80, 90, even to 100 degrees. And so you've got a wide spread of temperature. This takes planning. Realize that while you anticipate a nice warm race 
without the weather being a massive, without at least the cold being a big influence on your performance, you certainly want to arrive to transition with enough clothes to be warm so that you can be warm before you actually hop into the swim. Unlike the May edition, the water temperature here isn't going to be a massive factor. It's going to be really smooth, nice and fluid as we go through. Let's talk about uh, oh, one last thing before we go into the swim. Tire pressure as well. When you do give your bike to Tri Bike Transport or if you do decide to rack your bike yourself and set it up, make sure that you don't leave your tire pressure very high. If uh, in this nice hot afternoon where the temperature extends into the early evening being very high temperature, you don't want to have your tire pressure at race pressure where it's going to go up and maybe you're going to flat tire without realizing it. You don't want to show up on race day and have a flat tire when you're there and having to be running around on race morning trying to get it fixed. Leave the tire pressure a little bit lower on race morning, be prepared, get there early enough to actually put the proper tire pressure in as you go throughout the race day. Let's talk about the swim. A much improved swim from, uh, from the old Vineland course. This is now all deep. You will have to swim the whole 2.4 miles. It's in Lake Sonoma. There's a few components that are worthy of consideration here. The actual setup of the course is relatively simple, but this is a lake that can experience some chop. They've set up the swim specifically so that you actually have less chop, you're less influenced by it, but don't be surprised if you have a little bit of that small wave chop on top of the water surface. That can influence your sighting, it can certainly influence your rhythm of swimming. So be prepared for that, stay supple when you're swimming if you are, have got a choppy conditions, you're not going to have big rolling waves or anything like that, you're in a lake. At the same time, it could be dead flat, but just be prepared that you might get a little bit of chop. Secondly, I think you have to be prepared for different types of light in the morning. If it is fogged in, if it as often is, and then you want to have some goggles that are a little bit more clear, maybe some rose colored goggles that will help you see the buoys really easily because when you're at this much water's edge and you're looking across, it's hard to navigate. At the same time, if it happens to be a clear morning, you want to have in your, in your bag a little bit of smoke colored or mirror goggles to come off of the rising sun as you go through right at the time that the sun is really coming up and starting to hit you in the face. So be prepared with the goggles. Overall, uh, the water temperature isn't gonna be a massive factor, very consistent. I won't spend today talking too much about pacing, but you are looking for a managed effort on this swim. And I think the biggest mistake that many athletes make in any Ironman swim is to go out too aggressively and thinking that they have to go out fast to catch a draft. Your number one predictor of your swim performance being relative to your train potential is swimming in a straight line. So sight frequently, make sure you understand the course, be aware of the conditions, and go through. The real swim personality begins at the end of this. One of the big features of this course is when your feet hit dry land. Because unlike many other courses where you just have a nice, easy, fluid, little gateway into the transition, you have to go up a relatively steep and stubbornly, stubbornly consistent grade for a good three or four hundred meters. It's the boat ramp, it's the ramp that they use to actually end the driveway to put boats into the water. That's gonna be a real feature because transition one, your first transition going from swim to bike is typically the place where your heart rate is highest in the race anyway. And this is magnified at Ironman Santa Rosa because you come out of the water when you've been in a prone position and you have to run up a grade. And it's a good six or seven percent grade and it's long enough to be very stubborn and can be very painful. My goal or well, my, my advice there is be very, very managed. And so if you're out there looking for consistency, you're not looking to win your age group and then manage the effort up there. I think that the return on investment and the speed penalty of walking up there with purpose, actually walking up there with purpose rather than running up, is probably worthy for a large percentage of the athletes that are participating here. There is an option to leave shoes down there. I would recommend for the majority of you guys to leave shoes down there. It's rough enough surface 
with you don't know what hanging out on the um, on the concrete there that it's probably a good thing to leave a pair of shoes not your racing shoes not your running shoes they should be over at T2 but an old pair of shoes that are easy to slip on that you can run on and just be more comfortable you don't want to cut your feet but manage the effort up there even if you're walking with purpose or doing a little bit of a run walk there is very little to be gained by going really hard up transition once you get up to the exit you go back in you go into transition and this is a pretty large transition area it's pretty vast it's not overly crowded which is a good thing but you want to know where your bike is go through seamlessly and be rehearsed on the order that you're going to do things go through understand where you're going to go know where your bike is and I think it's the goal is ruthless efficiency more than anything rather than really wanting to rush you want to get your system calm as you're going through transition rather than being really really aggressive through transition and there's a big reason for that in this race the first is it might be a little chilly you might be a little cold coming off it's probably not cold enough that you're good that most people won't need things like gloves and arm warmers it's going to warm up pretty quick so most of you guys are probably good without putting extra layers on but it might feel a little crisp and when you come out and you move on to the bike now the first thing that you do is you go across a nice bridge you go over the swim that you've just seen that's very high and then you go downhill fast now in that downhill, riders are not allowed to ride in their aero bars. You have to be down in your, in your hoods, but it's very fast. And there are some turns. That's an important component because that first descent is very fast. It's not a place that's going to be race defining. In fact, it shouldn't be race defining. So be calm, be efficient. Don't be too aggressive down there. You can't go down in your aero bars. The pros did not go down in their aero bars in the 70.3 even though they easily could have done with their skills but they get down to the bottom of the climb you want to use that to descend and try and settle the system really try and calm down but you're not going to be able to find rhythm on your bike so it, don't be surprised if you hit the bottom of the descent which is mile and a half or two miles in length when you hit the bottom of that descent the first thing that occurs is that you take a left turn and you have a smooth grade coming up you probably won't feel great when you start that but you want to use that first grade the first set of rolling terrain in fact one of the main feature climbs of the whole course occurs very early and rather than thinking about that as a challenge I would use that to go through protocols to try and make yourself feel better and so that's your part your opportunity to say okay this is my chance to settle this is where I want to set up my good posture and good form and go through the different elements of riding that make you feel better. So don't be overly concerned if you feel a little rough around the edges because you've just been in a prone position, had to go uphill, go through transition and then started straight downhill. So you might be chilly. So use the next three or four miles to really try and get into nice rhythm and nice smooth. The course is all about management. We're not gonna to talk too much today about pacing because everyone has their own feature but the one thing that's really important is that there is a lot of variety on this course there's a lot of northern california rolling terrain which actually is a wonderful set of terrain to have to help you if you manage it well it's really really helpful to be a catalyst to help you run off the bike so rather than looking at some of the climbs and thinking goodness me this is really lumpy it's a harder bike course the body responds really well to variance and so if you execute this really well and manage the terrain and make sure that the wheels keep moving and be really consistent that natural variety in this rolling course is going to actually help you feel better coming off the bike here realize that as we go through and more about that in a second as you go through the bike course it's going to start cool and incrementally it will start to warm up and at some point the sun is going to come out. You may start with the sun out, but more than likely at some point the sun is going to come out. The interesting thing about that is that early in this bike ride, you're not going to get the signals that you need to fuel and you need to hydrate. But trust me, on the back end of this bike ride and certainly the whole run, 
your goal is to deliver yourself to the end of this bike ride as close to full hydration as you can because you will be shedding fluids on the run course. And so early in this bike course as you're looking and struggling to find rhythm and you're using the terrain to find rhythm, don't forget to start fueling and hydrating early. Follow your program and consistency is much more important than overload. So you don't need to stuff yourself, you don't need to try and be a camel, but just consistently start. And unfortunately in races like this, many athletes go through the first hour and look down and think, goodness me, I haven't taken in any fluids at all or any calories. That spells problems later down the road. So a little reminder, do it early, do it consistent, consistently, and then carry it through the course. It's a two loop course. The good thing is you do not have to go back up to that top transition. You don't have to climb up and descend that big nasty climb twice. So the majority of this terrain is really smooth and really rolling and it's all about course management. I did, did see a question come up about course management so I'll answer that a little bit later and go through. Make sure that you're aware of the tools that you have. Making sure that you can go through a little big gear, a little faster gear, and really this is probably not gonna be a big course that's overly influenced by wind. But if there is wind, the chances are that you're gonna be managing more of most of the loop being more of an over the shoulder wind and cross winds than you probably will have any block headwinds on this course globally. The one last thing about the bike course that I think is worthy of mention, a couple of things. The first is the road surface. There are some areas on this course where it's Northern California, it's the wine country, there's a reasonable amount of potholes and cracks in the road, it's older roads, uh, very scenic roads, you're going to enjoy riding through the wine country, but just maintain awareness, you have got some gravel on the side of the road, many of the potholes have been spray painted, but there are some ridges in the road, some other potholes, so you always want to be aware from a safety component of getting around the bike course and making sure that you're looking for the, for the, for the potholes that are here. The second component is while some of the roads are close to traffic, others are not. And you do have to actually be responsible, even though the police should be stopping you, even though the roads should be closed. At the same time, it's wine country, it's still your responsibility, you still wanna go home. So I'll just leave you with, hey, stay aware when you go through that. Let's go through to the run course, and hopefully we can go through. The run course, if you look at the feature, and they have made some adjustments to the run course, but overall, this is a wonderful Ironman run course. You have plenty of opportunity to find softer surface that's more forgiving on your legs. You've got plenty of opportunity to be running in shade. You're running much of the time along the river, and there's a little bit of variety in here, which is really good for mixing up your muscle groups and saving some of the quad bashing type run that maybe occurs on dead flat courses. The little bit of variety is there is really nice, but by no means is this a hilly run course. The one thing that slows the course down a little bit, when you look at it, you think, oh, this is a very, very fast course. There are two things that are gonna slow this course down. The first is the temperature, and the second is there are a few components where you have to do some 90 degree turns and some tight turns that means you have to decelerate and, decelerate and re-accelerate a fair amount. So overall, it's actually not quite as fast of a course as you might imagine. At the same time, it is very forgiving. It does give you the option to actually stay in the shade, have a little bit of variety, and be on a really, really nice surface. With the three loops, you might think it will get very congested, but it's not a huge race in numbers. And actually, it's a wide enough spread that while it does get narrow at the same time, I don't think that congestion is going to be a huge challenge on this course. If you go to Ironman.com and you look at the course profile, it makes it look like a very feature-heavy course. But I invite you to actually go there and look at the scale, and you realize that it's much more subtle than that. You've got a long time where you're gradually running down the river, and then you're gradually running up the river. The places where you have variants are more of the areas where you're crossing the roads and going under tunnels and going over bridges, and those are good opportunities 
to mix up load. On a course like this globally, anytime you're going downhill, you want to be running. And anytime you're going uphill, you want to be managing. So it's a course of awareness where you're managing your effort and realizing, being really aware that while it might be perceptive, have a perception of actually being flat, you might have a slight 2% grade downhill. So you might feel great at those components, but it's really important to retain that awareness because when you flip around and come back the other side, it's equally important that you realize that you're running uphill. So this is not a pace chaser. This is not a, where a race where you just say, I want to run an eight minute mile pace, period. There's still, even though it's subtle, there's still a little bit of management around the course terrain and real awareness. And so much like the bike, and much might like the run, I think it's really important that you focus and are really aware on that. Same thing as the, uh, same thing as the bike ride, fluids, every single aid station, a real awareness of the heat. It's not something to be fearful of, it's something to be managed, but much in the same way as that terrain and running uphill, if it does end up being a very hot day, you don't wanna be a pace chaser. You want to manage your best effort throughout the day be really consistent and what I would encourage you today to do if it's very very hot is to just break down the whole problem into three distinct mini projects you've got 42 kilometers or 26.2 miles to get ready for this run and it's a big problem and emotionally it can be a bigger problem if it's hot because now you've got environment layered onto it and so I would really encourage you to say, we've got three natural breaks here. We've got three loops of the run course for the most part. I would break it down and solely focus on a single loop. And that loop, give or take, is about eight miles. I'll solely focus on, that, on that, what I'm gonna do in that eight miles. And the things that you can control are your posture and form, your pacing and your self-management, and that includes the terrain management that I talked about and your fueling and hydration. And I would singularly focus on just executing the eight miles and then I would refresh. I would clean out, cut off emotionally and restart and then go through with the second loop. For the vast majority of athletes, this is not an Ironman, it's not the type of race that you try and negative split. It's more about project management as you go through. And the final component, this is a wonderful finish to the, uh, to the Ironman. You finish right in the square. It's a great place for your families and, and friends to come and watch. It's a great place to finish the race, so it's really enjoyable. If this happens to be your first Ironman, my big advice is don't let it bypass you. Don't allow this occasion to bypass you and expect that you're gonna go through challenges, expect that you're gonna go through some dark moments Every Ironman has air at times where you feel fantastic and times that you feel a little lethargic or things happen that you don't plan on and you have to self-manage. At the end of the day though, your mission is to maximize your performance with what you're given on race day, whatever is put in front of you. And if it is your first or your last, your first Ironman I should say, that last month, one mile, soak it in, let it marinate, put a smile on your face and make sure that you embrace that finish shoot because it's a really magical finish shoot. This is, the town really gets behind it. It should be really fun. I think it's really encouraging. Final thing before we go to questions, uh, we have at Purple Patch a really robust course preview that takes through all of this that's written out. If you go to Purple Patch Fitness, all you have to do is click on the education tab and if you just do a search for Santa Rosa, or if you go down to July 10th is where it's actually posted, that's when we post it, there's a complete overview of the course, the logistics, my thoughts on the swim, bike and run and breakdown that I think will be really helpful. It's free, it's open to everyone. We build it as a resource for our Purple Patch athletes, but we wanna share it with you guys. So feel free to come there and, uh, and enjoy that. And I think, we might have some questions. Yeah, uh, back on the swim, a uh, question about um, would the ramp be carpeted? And our experience from the 70.3 was only partially. Only partially, it's a, it's a very long ramp and you will come out and when your feet hit the ground, you're gonna hit some lovely carpet and before you know it, you're gonna be running on some very, very rough concrete. 
and while they sweep it, you don't know what's going to be on there. And there's a, there's a good chance that if the whole field run up with bare feet, at least a couple of them are going to have some nasty gashes from something, whether it's on the edge of a sharp rock or something that's dropped. So um, for the vast majority of athletes, if it was pros, I'd say, hey, toughen up, run up there. But, um, but for the vast majority of athletes looking to have a super day, I would, um, I would uh, uh, have a pair of shoes down there, to be honest. Yeah, and then a question on the bike course was about managing the rolling terrain because there's not a lot of like dead flat ground that's constantly up and down. So how do you manage that from a power perspective if you had a target power, for example? Yeah, so the, the question, if in, just in case you didn't hear, was managing the bike course. And if you have a target power, um, how do you manage that? And it, it's a super question. Uh, let me give you a little example, and I'll give you a hypothetical. It's a hypothetical that... Um, that actually uh, my, my coaching partner, Paul Buick, uh, came up with, and it's, it's perfectly true. So imagine if you had a one kilometer piece of road. Now this is a hypothetical, it's a magnified example, it's not real, but the concept is the important thing. Let's say we have a rider that uh, wants to average 250 watts for this bike ride, which will be a very good output over the course of the bike ride. If you have a one kilometer road that's about 5% grade and a one kilometer descent at 5% grade. Many coaches and athletes will teach their, their riders to actually ride up the hill at 250 watts, that's the average that he's looking for, and ride down the hill at 250 watts. And so that equals a 250 watt average over the course of that stretch of road. Well, if we take that same rider and we ask him to repeat it and he rides going up the hill at above that, and he rides at more like 300 watts, which is a heavier output, but it's an easier output to actually manage because you're going against a grade. But riding up at 300 watts and then rode down the hill, riding down the hill at 175 watts, a much lower power, that second example would be much, much quicker. Over the course of that two kilometers, maybe upwards of 30 seconds faster. And that hasn't even brought into place that he can actually accelerate over the top of that roller with a little bit more power. Just two or three seconds, six to ten pedal strokes where he might output 330, 340, 350 watts to accelerate over the top. And so when you think about course management, the last thing you want to do, while that's a hypothetical one kilometer, one kilometer example, we minimize that down to that happening really frequently. So the last thing that you want to do is think, I want to average X power, and so no matter what, I'm just going to look down at my power meter, and I'm going to try and stick to that. Because one of two things will happen. You'll either explode and have a very poor run, or you're going to go slower than you could go. It's much better to actually let the watts flow, and if using our 250 watt example, on the uphills, expect to see a slightly elevated 10 or 20% higher power output, crest over the top with a little surge, three, four, five pedal strokes to gain momentum, and then down, using the downhills, let the feet roll and don't chase power, because chasing power downhill won't give you the speed return. So that's a very quick and dirty example of terrain management, but it's really important to think through that as you go in this course where there's a whole lot of it to do. Right. Question on the run course, do I need a headlamp on the run course or is it well lighted? Depends how fast, yeah, depends how fast you go. Um, you know, that's a super question that I don't know the exact, the, I, I, I'm pretty sure there is no light there. Yeah. Um, in fact, along the river pass, I'm thinking back, a lot of the, the early stages of the run, the late stages of the run, very well, well lit, downtown, etc. But the meat of this run is along the river shaded so under trees and certainly no street lamps so I would certainly bring uh, some lighting to go through and, and some of the, um, uh, the, the fluorescent uh, bands and things like that if you do anticipate finishing the dark. And, and sunsets probably like gets dark around 8.30 probably yep. this time of year. Um, yeah, someone actually just added 8.30 p.m. sunset. Yep. Last question from Jeff Miller, rain tips. He's clearly never been to Northern California in the summertime. Jeff, here's, here's the good news, and, and I'll say this, it's not going to rain. It's just not going to rain. There's uh, the chances of it raining, never say never, but it's not going to rain. <laughs>
it is not going to rain in Northern California at this time of the year in July. It just simply won't. The one thing you might have is that slight greasy surface from the fog. Um, if for some crazy thing, and uh, Jeff, I'll coach you for a year for free if, uh, if it pours with rain over the course of uh, that terrain. Uh, but um, uh, the, uh, if it does happen to rain, just reduce your tire pressure a little bit uh, to enable it to be sticky. And it will be the first rain for a couple of months, so you want to be very, very careful because you would expect some slick areas. At the same time, there aren't too many crazy turns or terrain to navigate on this particular course, so I don't think it's going to be an overall feature. And hey, it will cool down the run, so it'll probably end up being a faster day. Um, a couple of questions, uh, and I actually don't know the answer. Do you exit the water after the first loop? It's not clear on IMM's website. So. Yeah, it's it's not clear, and I actually that's something that I um that I sent a question about and didn't resp and didn't hear back. So the answer is I'm not uh, not clear, and that might be because they haven't decided yet. Uh, my guess would be that you do hop out and go around, but it's something that they will have figured out certainly by race day. But I sent a question to a friend of mine that was an old race director, but I just didn't hear back. I, uh, I thought about that, so I'm afraid I don't have an answer to that right now. Um, Dave Reed, um, the race director, is doing a Facebook Live to discuss the new run course tomorrow around this time, so um, pop on and, and ask him a question then, he should know. And he does a super job of race directing, so, um, so I, I'd recommend that you guys do hop on with him for sure. Cool. That's it. Yeah. Any questions? All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for joining. Uh, feel free to come to Purple Patch Fitness and get that free resource with the um, with the uh, the course preview. And we're going to do a lot of course previews for a lot of the other races coming up for the rest of the year. And I uh, look forward to seeing you out there. I hope everyone has a super day. Cheers. Take care.